Welcome to the CBS Radio Mystery Theater Archives, the only YouTube channel which has the original classic episodes of the CBS Radio Mystery Theater in order with no ads. Thank you for listening, and now, enjoy the show. G. Marshall. I am the wound and the knife. I am the blow and the cheek. I am the victim and the executioner. And thus we become the things we do. The flame consumes the wood and dies. And too late does the killer discover that the life he takes in the end is his own. What am I doing here? You heard me call you. How could I hear you? I live miles away. No, you live here, in my heart, in my soul. What are you saying? You came because I needed you. You need me? I need you. I worship you. You're a goddess. Oh, no. I'm just a typist. You're a goddess. You created the world. And all of us who are in it. What do you want? I want to worship you. Live for you. Die for you. Even kill for you. Our mystery drama, The God Killers was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Tammy Grimes. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Vanity of vanities, we are told. All is vanity and a searching after wind. True. And yet, Just a little vanity? Can it be so bad? Don't we need it to add a bit of piquance to life? Especially women. Who would give a woman a second look if she didn't have just a touch of vanity? Ursula Underwood has no vanity at all. Zero. And the result is, no one has ever given her a first look. Ursula at 40, who doesn't think to hide the approaching gray in her hair whose lips have always been innocent of lipstick, shy, quiet, and self-effacing Ursula Underwood. But here she is, suddenly a center of attraction, literally in the spotlight, surrounded by eager, impatient, anxious men. How did this happen? Well, she's been accused of murder. Okay, Miss Underwood, you better come clean. I didn't do it. Uh, Make it easy on yourself. I didn't do it. Where'd you get the knife? Why'd you kill him? I didn't do it. We know you killed him. He was going to fire you. You had the motive. Wasn't he going to marry someone else? You're jealous. That's why you killed him. You picked up that knife and you killed him. Confess. We know what happened. I didn't kill him. I swear to you, I didn't kill him. All right, all right, all right, Joe, Larry. Take a break. I'll handle it. Oh, okay, Lieutenant. (laughs) She's all yours. Miss Underwood, please, listen. My name is Lieutenant Barney Chestakovich. I didn't do it. I assure you that you will feel better if you tell us the truth. I didn't do it. My advice to you is confess. Just confess you killed Mr. Alistair Pollister. You, you'll feel better. You know, confession lifts the weight off of your soul. I didn't do it. <sighs> Miss Underwood, uh, can we set some ground rules? Just don't keep saying you didn't do it. Lieutenant Chestakovich, I tell you I didn't do it. Please, I want to help you. You want to help me? Why don't you confess? What you want is another scalp for your belt. Another notch in your gun. If I confess, will you become Captain Chestakovich? Uh, probably. So the truth is, 
You want to help yourself? No, I, I want to help both of us. Please, leave me alone. I would, if you were a professional killer. Then they could just, you know, throw you at the jury and your reputation alone would be enough to convict you. But the way it is now, you see, we need your confession. But I didn't do it. And you need your confession, too. You need it to make peace with yourself. Lieutenant, I... Don't fight it. Yield to it. Give way. Give in to your, your better impulses, to your truer nature. Lieutenant... Let's, let's be friends. Hmm? Call me Barney. I'll call you Ursula. You... You're trying to seduce me. <laughs> Ursula, I'm only trying to get to... Where were you with your soft voice and gentle manner and sweet air of concern when I needed you? Oh, how I wanted someone like you. Dreamed of. Prayed for someone like you. Uh, Ursula. Oh, that name. That ugly name. Ursula. You know what it means? A female bear. A she-bear. Oh, my Lord. How could parents name a little girl? Female bear. Oh, no, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty name. It's an ugly name. And I'm an ugly woman. Oh, uh, no. No one ever thought I was pretty. No one ever treated me as if I were pretty. And so I never became pretty. Well, you're, you're, you're a handsome woman. A big woman. Tall ungainly. I'm a bear of a woman. But you have... You have certain qualities which are really quite attractive. You are trying to seduce oh, me. Oh, no, 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 I, I'm not. No, please, you must believe me. It's all right. I rather like it. This has never happened to me before. Now, I know what it is to hear a man's gentle voice when he wants something from me. Something only I can give him. Now... <laughs> I would like to set the record straight. Don't spoil it. You see, the pretty girls get this all the time. What a man wants from them is pleasure. Miss Underwood. And they know it. In our hearts, we women know it. But men lie so beautifully. And for a moment, it's all so wonderful that it's worth it. Miss Underwood, we are still at ground zero. Nobody. How can you say that? We've made progress. What you want from me is not pleasure, but something even more important, a promotion. Oh, now, please, please, Miss Underwood, and please. And because you make me feel so good, so needed, I'll help you. You will? Because I love you. Oh, don't worry. You have no cause for alarm. You don't have to do anything about it. You probably are happily married. With half a dozen children. Uh, uh, Miss Underwood, maybe I'd better come back later. Huh? Please, forgive me, Bonnie, for embarrassing you, but I want to be seduced. Even if it's only a figure of speech in a prison cell. Please, Bonnie, keep on being kind to me. Talk to me softly, sweetly, the way you did before. Uh, Ursula, I do, I, I do want to help you. I know, no, no, I I'll, know. I'll help you get the best possible deal. Yes, you will. It's a crime of passion. You see, it is an unwritten law, and it's on your side. Now, Alastair Pollister betrayed you. Now, all these years, he led you on. And then he was going to throw you out after you'd uh, given him your youth, your whole life. Ursula, you won't even do a year in jail. Now, I know juries. Believe me. I believe you. Let's make it happen. Sign the confession. Keep talking to me, Bonnie, please. Well, I've said everything that's important. Keep talking to me. Alistair Pollister never talked to me the way you do. For 15 years, I was a secretary. I was nothing to him but an instrument. At 9 a.m., good morning, Miss Underwood. And then three uninterrupted hours of dictation. At 12, have your lunch, Miss Underwood. At 1, let us resume, Miss Underwood. At 4, enough for the day. Never a social word. Never an idle word. He knew absolutely nothing about me. There was never a kind word. Never a harsh word. Just... Hello, goodbye. Read that back. Type that up. Here's your check. Why did you kill him? I didn't kill him. Ah, uh, look. But I'll tell you who did. What? The Shiv. The what? The Shiv. You know what a Shiv is? It's underworld slang for a knife. Uh, 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 Ursula, 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 when the cops came in, uh, you were standing there, and he was dead on the floor. Now, there was the knife with the blood all over it. But you didn't find my fingerprints on that knife. Because you had wiped 
wipe them off. Had I done that, I would have wiped off the blood, too. I tell you, the Shiv. Uh, uh, who, who is the Shiv? The hero of his last book. You mean, you mean there is actually such a person as the Shiv? Oh, yes. And he knifed Mr. Pollister to death. Well, why didn't you say so? Why didn't you say there'd been someone else in the room? Because... Because... What? Because until now, no one would believe me. Why not? Oh, Barney, I'm allowing myself to think you care enough to believe me. You do care, don't you? Yeah, yeah, and how about the ship? We must begin with Mr. Alistair Pollister himself. Why do men become writers? Well, I... Uh, no, is that important? Vital. Some turn to writing because of an urgent need for self-expression. Others are motivated by the need for fame. Some are inspired by the financial rewards. Yes, well, all this may be pertinent, but we should get down but to... But none of these reasons accounted for Alistair Pollister. Do you know why he became a writer? Well, I, I, don't, I don't think because I... Because he had an uncontrollable desire to kill. What do you mean he had a... An uncontrollable desire to kill. Oh, yes. Did, did he ever actually, uh, actually commit... Uh, Murder? Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, dear, Barney. Hundreds of times. Do you realize what you're saying? He didn't have the courage to kill real living people. Therefore, he became a writer. And that way, he could create people of his own. And he would kill them. Ah, uh, oh, oh, yes, I see. Uh, now, look. Uh, you've had a, a, a long, hard day. Why don't I let you get some rest? No. Don't treat me as if I were mad. I'm not. You said you'd be kind to me. No. All right. All right. You must understand so you will know why and how he died. You see, he lived for murder. His only thought was to kill. His only pleasure was to, to destroy life. She was his prisoner. Uh, not just the captive of his strength, but the slave of his will. Do you have that, Miss Underwood? Yes, sir. She knew she should run, at the very least scream, even beg for mercy. But she stood absolutely still, completely silent, waiting. Waiting for the knife in his hand to enter her body. Waiting. And then, finally... Just below her breast, the flash of steel, the short, sharp, steering stab. The sudden gush of crimson and the pain, oh, the pain. For a moment, she, she felt it swell and then it stopped. For the heart, the beating heart had also stopped. It was dead. There was nothingness. From a void she had come, to a void she returned. Mr. Pollister. <laughs> Mr. Pollister. What? Well, well, what is it, Miss Underwood? Shall, uh, shall we continue? No, no. Uh, enough for the day. Yes, sir. That was the ship. Mr. Pollister's most notorious murderer. Surely you've read some of Mr. Pollister's books. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. Well, I mean, I get enough violence and murder on the job. I don't need any for refreshment. The ship. Okay. Uh, he's this character in Pollister's book? Yes. And you say he killed Mr. Pollister? I know he killed him. But if he is only a character in a book, someone who exists only on a printed page, how could he? Oh, I get it. The ship must be based on a real-life character, and it's this character who murdered Pollister. No. What do you mean, no? The ship is totally a figment of Mr. Pollister's imagination. And yet, it was the Shiv who committed the murder. But... <sighs> okay. Have it your way. Oh, please don't be angry with me. If you want to solve the Pollister murder, listen to me, Barney. Listen. Ursula, what you are telling me is impossible. No, Barney, it's true. A character in a book can commit murder? Try to believe me. Trust me. I love you. The first and only love of my life. Would I lie to you? I'm not sure I know how to handle that question. Chivalry would prompt me to say no. But here we are dealing with the emotional and chemical reactions that crackle between highly charged men and women. At any rate, 
Our story has only begun, and we can withhold judgments and answers, at least till Act Two, which I shall bring you in a few moments. Can a man be killed by a character in a book? A completely fictional character whose only life, if we can call it that, exists on a printed page? Before you answer that, you might pause to consider, for all we know, we, ourselves, might be fictional characters in somebody's book. Bonnie, I wouldn't lie to you. I wouldn't lie. Ah, uh, no, n- not deliberately. But Ursula, how can you how can you hope to make me believe that a fictional character can come to life and and and, and commit a murder? Bonnie, I can hope for anything now. Now that I'm in love. Look. Let's put that in its place, too. And I think it's gone far enough. Please, but... don't say any more. But I have to. All right, I admit. I admit I was flirting with you. Well, after all, I was trying to soften you up to get your confession. I know that. Then why do you... Why do I persist in maintaining this illusion? Yes. Because I have nothing else. This poor, pathetic illusion is the best I'll ever have. This ridiculous flirtation in a jail cell is as close as I'll ever come to. To an intimate conversation with with an attractive man. I'm sorry. I could sign a confession saying, I plunged that knife into Pollister's heart. Would you like me to do that now? Yes. Even if it isn't true? Uh, but please, don't place me in that kind of position. Then you really do care for me. A little. Look, I'm a cop. I'm doing a job. Everybody knows you killed Pollister. How does everyone know that? Oh, for crying out loud. There was no one else in the house. The neighbors heard you both screaming at each other. But I said I didn't do it. I know. Look, you were fighting about this, this fictional character, the Shiv. But he's not fictional. He's real. Wait. Wait you, you, you said before that he... he All was... I said was that he was created. By Mr. Pollister. Uh, now what am I supposed to believe? That Pollister could create the type of character that can step out of the pages of his book and plunge a knife into Pollister's heart? Is that what I'm supposed to believe? Yes. Oh, ground zero. We're not just back there, we're below there. It's true. Do you know what that sounds like? Do you have any idea what that sounds like? Yes. And do you know why I have the courage to say it? To reveal to you my innermost secret... Because I love you. Yeah. It's true. I, 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 I think I understand. And maybe it'll even work for you. What are you talking about? <laughs> As if you didn't know. You're laying the foundation for an insanity defense. Is that what you think? Well, it figures. All right, Bonnie, I'll sign a confession. Uh, well, now you're talking sense. And uh, you'll feel a lot better. You'll see. No, I won't feel better. I'll feel deceived and abandoned. You have this fantasy that I murdered Mr. Pollister, and you want me to support it by signing a confession. Ah, uh, okay, Miss Underwood. You win. Mm, please, don't leave me. Not yet. Don't let it be over just yet. Let it last a little bit longer. Look at me the way you looked at me before. Talk to me softly and hold my hand. Then I'll do anything you say. Anything. Miss Underwood. Perhaps I can make it possible for you to to find the Shiv. You see, he killed Mr. Pollister for a reason. What reason? Deicide. Hmm? It means murder of a god. Uh, I don't understand what that means. Deicide. I never thought about it until one morning. Instead of dictating fiction, he said to me... Mr. Pollister said to me... I want you to take a letter to the editor of the Times Review. Yes, Mr. Pollister. Sir, the stupidity of your reviewer is too much to bear. Do you have that? Yes, sir. I am, he claims, obsessed with blood and death. Very well, I have the right to be. I was created by a god who is also seemingly obsessed with blood and death. Our entire world is based upon blood and death. Fighting and killing are inborn instincts. War is so easy, so common, so easily begun, that indeed it must be second nature. 
I am merely patterned my worlds after the only world I know. All I have done is stripped away the hypocrisy. I have exposed us for what we are. Now, have that ready for my signature sometime today. And now, let us return to chapter uh, five. His eye fell on a mace. With one blow, he could shatter her skull. Miss Underwood? No. Yes, sir? You seem to be in a trance. I'm sorry. I shall repeat. His eye fell on a mace. I'm sorry, Mr. Forrester. I don't know what I was thinking of. The thought was one blow. I can shatter her skull. I don't know what got into me. Miss Underwood, please do not interrupt. Y yes, sir. And the brilliant blonde hair would be spattered with crimson. I was terrified. Of what? Of what he had written in that letter to the editor. Why? Because I've, I've never looked at it that way before. What way? Till then. It had just been dictation. It had meant nothing. Just words. And I was putting them down, typing them up. Well, I, st I still don't follow. For the first time, I realized that these were real people... What do you mean, real people? These are just characters in books. No. They live. They live. Oh, yeah. Well, I... Uh... You think I'm crazy? Well, you talk this way to a jury and you'll have it licked. Suddenly, they were more than just words on a printed page. They were really human. They had... There's a word. Presence. You're going to laugh at me. Don't. Please, not you. Don't you laugh at me. I couldn't stand that. No, I, 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 I'm not laughing. He would draw them beautifully. So beautifully. And then he would kill them. There was a man. A man named... Named... Stephen Shea. With laughing blue eyes and a flashing smile. Stephen Shea. Fleet of foot... With light of heart, singer of sweet songs, with a love for all mankind. Have you got that? Yes, sir. Stephen Shea, who asked for nothing but to make another human being happy. Stephen Shea, the modern troubadour who wandered the face of the earth, whose smile dispelled the darkness. Have you got that on the page, Miss Underwood? Yes. I've got it on the page, and I've also got it in my heart. Please, Mr. Porras, don't kill him. I don't believe I could stand it if you killed him. A note to myself put this down. He, Stephen Shea, will be the first victim of my newest character, the Shiv. Oh! Miss Underwood... Did you hear what I said? Are you... Are you going to kill Stephen Shea? What an odd question. Of course I'm going to kill him. But... What else is he good for? Yeah, to continue. Stephen Shea awoke that morning. That bright spring morning. The air, so fresh, so crisp, so clear, it crackled. Oh, God, he said. Thank you for giving me such a morning. Poor Stephen Shea. How was he to know this would be the last morning of his life? Eh. Well, it's uh, 12 o'clock. Take your break, Miss Underwood, and we'll kill him after lunch. When I walked out of his apartment, I was in a daze. Mechanically, automatically, I made my way to the little restaurant down the street where I always took my meals. I sat down at my usual quiet, out-of-the-way small table. I sat there in silence. Fortunately, the waiter was too busy to bother with me. I don't know what I could have said to him. I knew the tears were streaming quietly down my face. And then I became aware of someone. Of two flashing blue eyes and a bright smile. I looked into his face and I knew this was Stephen Shea. The singer of sweet songs. He was there at the table with me. Please, save me. Don't let me die. Save you? How? I don't want to die. Why should I die? 
Have I ever harmed anyone? He's going to kill me. I, I know. Can't you help me? What can I do? It's his will. It's God's will. But you're also divine. Who is? You are. You're a goddess. You helped make me. You put flesh on my bones, blood in my veins, thoughts in my head. But they belong to him. That flesh, those thoughts. But you placed it all on the paper. You are the handmaiden to God. You are also divine. He, he won't listen to me. I beg you. I don't want to die. Please save me. I'll worship you forever. I... Promise. I'll, Promise. I'll, I'll try. And so I was determined to save him. Now look, Ursula... I want you to consider uh, very seriously the idea of seeing a psychiatrist, you know? Don't, Bonnie. Don't treat me as if I were mad. Just be kind and patient but and you... sweet. I told him I would save him. But how? How could I keep the shiv from killing Stephen Shea? What could I do? These things that you're saying, now, they're not really helping you. You'll be shut up in an asylum for the rest of your life. Now, you're better off with the crime of passion, even self-defense. The jury has to be on your side. You don't believe a word I'm saying. Characters who come off a printed page. But suppose you can meet them, see them, talk to them yourself. Oh, that is impossible. Stephen Shea is gone, fled. I don't know where he is. But the Shiv... What about the Shiv? He's here. Here? Where? Nearby, at hand. Waiting for me to call. Okay, okay, then we're out of the woods. Now, if you can produce him, the shiv, you'd better do it. I will. All right, now we're getting somewhere. We're at that point where you've got to put the money on the table or walk away from the game. However, don't you walk away because it's a brand new game that we have for you in Act 3, which will happen here in just a few moments. We speak of the characters in books as fictional, which means they aren't real. But is that really true? Haven't so many fictional characters assumed a reality far more meaningful than most of our so-called flesh-and-blood people? Hamlet, Huck Finn, Don Quixote, Heidi. Haven't they been around longer, created more of an impact than anyone alive today? What is real and what is fiction? What endures and what disappears? You said... You could produce the ship. Yes. Well, when? He will come to me when I need him. <sighs> Look, for the sake of argument, uh, let's say he exists. Why should he come forward? Why? Because he worships me. He worships you? Huh? This I wasn't ready for. Why should he worship you? Because I made him. I created him. Ah, now, hold on. Hold on. Isn't, I mean, wasn't Pollister the maker, the creator? Yes. For 15 years, Alistair Pollister was the creator. But not for the last book. In the end, I became the creator. You? Yes. You see, I was afraid of all the evil Mr. Pollister was unleashing on the world. But all he was doing was just writing books. No, he was creating people. You must understand, people... Stephen Shea was a person, a wonderful human being. I had to save him, and so I tried the only way I knew how. Uh, good morning, Miss Underwood. I, uh, I believe we begin with Chapter 7. Title, Introducing the Shiv. It would be accurate to describe the raw material that went into the making of the Shiv as pure, undiluted evil. As some men worship gold, he worshiped death. As some men lusted after women, he lusted for blood. Killing was all that mattered. He was a machine. 
A merciless, remorseless, relentless machine. Mr. Uh, Mr. Pollister. Yes, yes, what is it? I know you don't like to be interrupted, but is that right? Is what right? Well, can any person ever be completely evil? Shouldn't there be one redeeming feature? Who says so? I, I would imagine... Miss Underwood. Sloppy sentimentalism does not change the basic facts of life. Or death. The Shiv did not know Stephen Shea. Didn't matter. The street was deserted. Shea had a throat. The Shiv had a knife. There was no flare of anger. No thrill of excitement. Before Stephen Shea was even aware of him, the razor-sharp blade of the knife had already severed his juggler. The Shiv did kill Stephen Shea. No. Well, how can you say no? That's what Pollister dictated. He may have dictated it, but I didn't write it. I wrote something else. Something else? Yes. I created a different character. How could you? I gave the Shiv another dimension. Oh, he was still a killer. But I gave him the ability to feel pity. But, but how? What Mr. Pollister dictated was one thing. What I typed up was something else. The Shiv had a knife. Before Stephen Shea was even aware of the killer, the blade was ready to enter the juggler. And Stephen Shea suddenly saw death. He said quietly to the Shiv, Why? Why do you want to kill me? And the Shiv, who had spilled blood a dozen times, was brought up short. Why? And quietly... He turned and walked away, as silently, as quickly as he had appeared. And as he walked, he kept saying to himself, Why? Why? So, what you're saying is, you, you rewrote the story Pollister was dictating, is that it? Yes. And that's how I became the creator. I became God. At least for the Shiv. Because that night I was asleep. And suddenly I was awake. I don't know why. I thought I heard a voice calling to me. Well, uh, what kind of voice? I didn't know at the time. I felt someone wanted me. Needed me. So I got out of bed. I dressed. I went out. I followed the voice. The way a plane follows a beam of radar. I came to a hotel. It was actually one of those cheap rooming houses. I followed the voice to our room. I opened the door. He was there, in a small, shabby, furnished room. Uh, who was? The Shiv. He was on his knees. He was praying. Please. My God. Come to me. Show yourself to me. Tell me what I have done. Please. <gasps> You. You're here. You called to me. Help me. I've killed a dozen human beings. None of it ever bothered me until tonight. Suddenly, I felt such a terrible wave of sorrow. Why? Why do I feel it? I never thought I was doing anything wrong. I only felt... I was following the orders of my God. I was, wasn't I? Yes, but you see, two gods were struggling for your soul. And now, you have a new master, a new creator. Do you feel it? Yes. Now, I feel it. Not a god of death, but a god of life. Not a god of darkness and hatred but a God of mercy and light. Yes. Will you serve this God? Yes. I will serve this God and fight for this God. I give you my blessing. So, now you're the God, uh, the goddess or whatever it is, to the ship. Yes. You must believe it. 
And uh, where is Palliser while all this is going on? Uh, now, here you are, rewriting everything he dictates. Now, sooner or later, he has to catch on, right? Yes. The piper would have to be paid eventually. He never bothered reading what I typed. He assumed I got it word for word. I usually did. And he would have me deliver it to the publisher. Later, when the galleys were sent to us, it was my job to proofread and correct. So once he had dictated the words, he saw nothing in print until the book was published. Well, finally, the shiv was published and released. I was in the office when he read the reviews. The shiv. The most complex character Alistair Pallister has ever created. <laughs> Poppycock. The shiv is the most simple, uncomplicated... What, though... What do they say in the Times? Uh, do you have it over there, Miss Underwood? Oh, thank you. Uh, just as we expect the Shiv to murder Stephen Shea, Stephen looks the would-be murderer in the eye and says, Why? Why do you want to kill me? And we feel a sudden chill because it has the same force as another question asked so many years ago. Saul, Saul, why persecuteth thou me? Ha! This man is a fool. I never wrote anything like... <laughs> Miss Underwood, hand me a copy of the book. He opened the book and began to read. I could see an entire parade of emotions move across his face. First amazement, then puzzlement, then confusion. Well, I'll sue that publisher... Oh, I'll have the shirt off his back. How dare he? This is not the manuscript you delivered. This is not the galley proofs you corrected. Hand me the carbon of your final draft. Mr. Pollister, they published the manuscript that was delivered. I'll have them recall every last cup. What did you say? What is contained in the book you now hold in your hand is the manuscript that was delivered. Miss Underwood... Have you finally taken leave of all your senses? How could such a manuscript be delivered? I never dictated this nonsense. It's true. You didn't dictate it. But I typed it. You typed it? Yes, sir. You typed it? I simply had to save Stephen Shea's life. And I, I had to give some humanity to the ship. You had to... You rewrote my book. How dare you presume? I dare presume anything. I am also a god. Leave this house this moment. Don't you dare shout at me. I'm your equal. I'm more than your equal. I'm your superior. Because both of us are gods. Both of us created a character. Both of us gave him life. And he chose me. The Shiv chose me. The Shiv. Worships me. You rewrote my book, you frustrated, dried-up old maid. Last you ugly, neurotic spinster. How dare you? How dare you, you insult me? Shiv, teach him respect. Teach him, Shiv. Are you crazy? No. No. I didn't mean for the Shiv to kill Mr. Pollister. I only meant for him to teach Mr. Pollister a lesson. But you see, I had forgotten how much violence there is in man. It always slumbers underneath, ready to be awakened. Do you understand, Pony? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I understand. He's so much like all of us, the Shiv. He has his thin veneer of morality. But all the time, surging inside his violence, raging mindless violence. Yes, well... And now, you... do you believe me when I tell you that it was the Shiv who killed Mr. Pollister? Miss Underwood, let me tell you what I think. Miss Underwood? Why do you call me Miss Underwood? For 15 years, day in, day out... We're not Miss Underwood and Lieutenant Chestakovich. You and I, we're Barney and Ursula. You have been listening to a never-ending story of death and murder and violence. We, we're lovers. And so, I guess I have to say... It's gotten to you. A, a psychiatrist would have a lot of technical terms for it. But, Miss Underwood, you have flipped. Miss Underwood. It's over. The sweetness is gone from your voice. The soft, gentle light no longer shines in your eyes. Miss Underwood, you deliberately choose to misunderstand. And so you use me 
and cast me aside as if I were some ordinary woman. But I do not choose to let you go. Uh, you've had a very trying day. I am a creator. I am God. I have chosen you. You will stay by my side, always. You will remind me constantly that I am a woman. You will love me. Look, I, 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 I have to be gone. No, you can't leave me. Shiv. Shiv. Make him stay. Miss Underwood, you... What's the matter? Look, don't try that. Make you, him stay. Make him stay. You're crazy. You're, you're crazy. Make him you're, stay. Go! Oh. Miss Underwood? Uh, I'm Sergeant Joe Maselli. I didn't do it. Uh, uh, <laughs> we know what happened. Now, for some reason, you started a fight with Lieutenant Chestakovich, and uh, you managed to grab the gun from his holster, and you... Uh, I didn't do it. And you shot him. Now, look, all you have to do is sign this statement. I didn't do it. Look, maybe you felt threatened. You might have lost your head. We know you're frightened and confused. I, I didn't do it. <sighs> Ursula, uh, let me call you Ursula. And uh, you should call me Joe. We should be friends because uh, we can help each other. You understand? Yes, I understand. You're a, a very unusual woman and... Uh... I understand. Hmm? You're trying to seduce me. Oh, no, no, no. I, I'm only... It's all right, I don't mind. Don't spoil it, please. Be kind to me. Be gentle, be sweet. I'll tell you who killed Barney Chestakovich. And why. They better get wise to that lady before she kills off the entire police force. Oh, but wait. Why did I say before she kills? After all, isn't it possible that a gentleman named the Shiv might have been taking an active hand in the proceedings. Who is to say Ursula Underwood isn't a goddess? You have to admit, our theater is one of the few places in this world where you can have your cake and eat it. I'll be back shortly. All the world, the poet said, is a stage. And by this time, we accept that. We know we're all players. We know we have our parts, whatever they are. We know we have our entrances and exits. We know quite a good deal. Except what we actually don't know is the name of the show. Where it's really playing. And how long it's going to run. Our cast included Tammy Grimes, Earl Hammond, Leon Janney, and Ken Harvey. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule, and Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.